Welcome to Eggs the Podcast, featuring the best and brightest minds in business leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Today's guest is Kurt Uhler, a leading product visionary and expert on the speed of change in technology, who has traveled coast to coast advising high growth companies on how to thrive in the age of disruption. Kurt's nonlinear career path started when his father brought home an Apple II GS, which led him to become an early hacker and hustler. He founded several businesses during high school and college, including Clear Vision, which generated thousands of dollars of free cash flow every month. Kurt then joined Navtech, where he stayed for 10 plus years through their successful $880 million IPO in 2004 and ultimate $8.1 billion sale to Nokia in 2008. He left his lead inventor on 13 U.S. and international patents, which have been licensed by companies such as Google, Facebook, and others, an accredited investor on dozens of startups, successful founder in several outside ventures, and a well-known business leader across multiple industries. Join us for the conversation as we chat with Kurt about his diverse experience and insights on disruptive technology, scaling companies, and building teams. All that and more on this episode of Eggs the Podcast. Hey, Kurt. How are you, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, great. Thanks for having me, Jim. Absolutely. Thrilled to have you here. Yeah, I um, just listening to the intro, I didn't know that uh, your first computer was an Apple II GS, so was mine. So uh, <laughs> that, that dates Good me company. and you. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I, yeah, awesome. I, re- I remember the Apple II GS. I actually, uh, I, I started contracting with some government entities when I was 14. My dad had security clearance in Red Sun Arsenal in Huntsville, and I got caught doing things I shouldn't have done. Uh, and so it was kind of like, hey, you can get in a lot of trouble or you can do some work for us. And uh, I remember when dad brought home this this Apple II GS that was decked out. It was like as much of a car as a car would have been. And I, I went back basically to the office because I, I went in like three days a week. And I told them what I had. I think it was like a one megabyte or two megabyte RAM computer. And they were like, oh my gosh, because that was so much more powerful than even <laughs> like Homeland Security <laughs> things we're using on Redstone Arsenal. And they're like, how did you have this? I was like, well, my dad could have got a new truck or he, he got me that computer. So, wow. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, no, my mom was a school teacher when I was a kid and her school had access to a bunch of Apple II. So I used to just go down there. I just, you know, being the high achiever I am, I was a master at uh, Odell Lake and Oregon Trail, you know, these kinds of things, you know, pretty high tech, but I wasn't doing any <laughs> programming or coding or government contracting. <laughs> so cool. Well, so Kurt, we, we got into it a little bit uh, in the intro, but let's talk about your story. I'm sure, you, you know, you do a lot of public speaking and stuff. So I imagine you've got a sort of a truncated version of your massive life scale that you could talk about. So let's talk a little bit about just sort of your trajectory from from youth to today. And uh, and I think that'll give us a good place to kick off. Yeah, I mean, I think the the most truncated version of it is, I mean, I have I've ended up as an adult and even before then in a lot of high growth technology companies. But I when I was 14, I had to form two LLCs that were not high tech. I mean, one was a lawn care company, but I hired enough friends. It was really clear. It was like, hey, at this point I had like 10 people. I was paying more than enough money. The government was going to force me to pay taxes. And then we started up another business on the side. And those are really brick and mortar shovel jobs. And if I look back over time, while I've now been in all these high growth industries and I've helped um, on my second hyper growth company, I, it really kind of comes down to for me is I tend to figure out ways to operate in almost any industry that I'm in. And so that's where I, what I really build myself as is an operator. I look for systems. I look for scaling. It, I mean, to me, this difference between growing Navtech, which kind of still the premier mapping company, you know, or almost any industry way bigger than even Google Maps today. You look at that. It's really not that much different than scaling a large real estate company and the technology for them. People think that they're different and it's always, there's always, you, you know, intricacies, but at the most part, I've been in so many different industries because I look for people that uh, are subject matter experts on the very fine tooth they, a team they need to do. And then I find a way to repeat that. I just happen to do it primarily in high growth technology companies as an adult, and we'll probably stay there. I'm in a big real estate company right now, eXp uh, Realty. They're the largest independently owned residential uh, real estate company in the world, in the US and in the world for both of those. And But I'm running product. I'm running technologies for them here. I'm, I'm building tools. That, so I'm, I'm not an agent. I'm not doing the agent operations. I'm doing all the tools that I've done in other industries, but making it very applicable to real estate right now. I like yeah, no, that. I, I, yeah, I think that's awesome. And and I love the sort of the trajectory from, you know, the do it yourself and sort of, I guess, more labor intensive jobs to, you know, moving into tech. And part of that probably has to do with sort of your age and the advancement of technology and things like that as you go. I mean, both Mike and I, I'm not sure your age, but Mike and I are sort of contemporary and we're of the, 
generation that spent the first half of our life without internet and the back half with it. And so it, there was a, a period there where if you wanted to be online, you had to learn to code or you had to learn how to do, you know, at least basic HTML or something so that you could have a presence online. And so I think that, you know, for people in our generation, you had sort of, you know, I guess an understanding of business that might have been a little more brick and mortar early on. And then technology facilitated the move forward. So I think it's really interesting to talk about, you know, sort of that process and how, how you made the move. So maybe let's talk about maybe what came second. So, you know, you're through school. Well, maybe it's not second for you, but you know, let's talk about your through school and sort of, I guess, your first, I guess, professional gig. Yeah, my first kind of professional gig, really. So after I, I went straight from my bachelor's to master's in financial engineering, so I can code out all of the high end financial equations that whether they're options or everything that's used by the investment banks, I kind of came out intending that I was going to maybe not be a full time programmer, but but be that that product lead between the, the full time programmers and the executives are saying, here's this complex equation to create mortgage backed security. And now go, we need a team to go create some technology. And I'm sitting in Chicago. I came as silver medalist for a couple of jobs that I wanted. And I get a call from a retained search firm that's like, hey, basically, you you seem like an entrepreneur. Can you come out and interview for this job? And I'm like, they told me about this company called, it was called Navigation Technology at the time. It became Navtech. It's now called Here Technologies. It is the dominant spatial data industry across the world. And um, I wasn't interested in it. I mean, because I, I knew what I wanted to do. And I think so many entrepreneurs and so many opera, you know, executives, they end up going like, this is what I want to do. And so the retained search person, she, she took the news kind of well. And a couple hours later, she called me back and she said, look, I, I spoke to the gentleman that, that you'd be working for. And so here's the deal. If you come out uh, an interview and you all find out that you're the right person for the job, if you don't like it anywhere within the first six months, they'll pay you out for the year. Hmm. Okay, now hey, now you bad. have my attention. No. Um, because I, I didn't think it was what I was going to do. But as I went in to go work for it, I realized one, I was going to end up working for this brilliant woman named Denise, but um, but but studying underneath um, a gentleman named Saladin Khan, who's the chief strategy officer. And I didn't know until I got in there that they had hired the former president of Disney, uh, of, of Disney theme parks. And he was the CFO of Disney as a whole. His name was Judson Green. Ended up being mentored by him a, a little bit while I was there, but then after I, he retired and after I left. And I had no idea like what I was walking into, but I, I talked to Saladin Khan and, and he was like, look, here's the deal. He kind of told me his background. It's a little bit like my background now. And he was like, you're going to be in all these meetings that, like, that you can never be in if you come work for me. And I'll tell you how I think. And I was like, it kind of seemed like I was getting an executive coach or I could, it was going to step into management consulting like at a Bain Capital or McKinsey without having to go deal with some of the toxic environments you hear there. And that's exactly what it ended up being. And so I had no concept what I was even agreeing to then. I look back at it. I, I spent 10 and a half years. I did a lot while I was there, angel investor and a bunch of things, but 10 and a half years, Think about all the places that use mapping data or traffic data. Mm -hmm. And so I would walk out of a meetings with Siemens VDO. They make the navigation system in a, in a, in a Lexus. Then I would walk into a meeting with FedEx uh, or UPS Logistics, who's using it for routing trucks. Then I would walk into a team with, because I ran the innovation teams, my innovation team meeting with Microsoft Video Games saying, hey, look, we think you can redesign how you build Microsoft Flight Simulator. They ended up doing that. And so... I was kind of at the core for 11 industries without knowing it. And no, there's no way I could have ever planned on that. So that's kind of, that was kind of the next step in my trajectory without having uh, kind of kept me where I'm at today. I was forced to not just be the automotive guy or a mobile person or a woman that just knows software because we were at this linchpin of enabling all of these industries really as technology was growing. That's, that's incredible. Just having those doors open to you at that early of an age and have that kind of mentorship and just be a part, just the fly on the wall in some of those meetings had to just be life changing. So, um, that, that, that's really incredible. Um, did you find that when you switched into this new job position, was there like a giant learning curve and how long did it take for you to kind of get your feet underneath you to understand the tech stack, understand what's going on? Um, or was it fairly quick? Was it similar to what you had been working on? 
it was very different. Like the job that I'm at right now is uh, the tech stack. I, I picked up pretty quickly. We've built all of our proprietary stuff internal. We built it off of a company we actually sold to the, the parent company here. But in the past, at like Navtech, I, I think it comes in waves for me. Usually I don't have to, there's not a huge learning curve up front. But as you start getting into projects, I usually get brought in from an operations perspective or marketing perspective where people are wanting to do things that just are not possible with the current team or the current technology. And so when you start looking at those things and you say, look, we don't want to grow 5%. We don't want to grow 50% even like, how do we grow 500%? You don't, you never do that with existing systems or existing technology. And so that's the point where you start going, okay, we all need to learn something different. And so there's learning curves through that. I mean, like even when I came back to, I came out of that master's and I went straight into working at Navtech. Like my first real learning curve there wasn't about their technology. That was easy enough to understand. It's mapping data, but not on a paper, but digitally. But we had one competitor really globally at that point. And how do you get competitive information? Well, they were public. I, so I had to self-teach myself European accounting standards because they were a European company to be able to merge between. And so I think the good thing for anybody in business, no matter what industry they're in, whether a solopreneur in, in real estate or, you know, they're helping, you know, run a, a 50 person or 5,000 person company is realizing, Hey, there's going to be things you need to learn. And it just, you need to figure out like what needs to be done at that time. And then either does somebody else on the team do it, but we're all capable of that. I think too often we just go, well, I don't know how to do this. Well, that's hard work. You, you need to figure it out or go look, teach from somebody else. Um, your comment before about like, the conversations is I was in on. I mean, I would encourage everybody that's getting started. Heck, if you're trying to, if you're a small business right now, or you've got a smaller business, like if you're not in a mastermind, like go find time to side hustle an intern. I don't care if you're 40 years old, if you're at an inflection point where you can't figure something out, find somebody who's figured out and go, can I just give you five hours of free work or 10 hours of free work on a, on a weekly basis just to be in some of those conversations? I've, uh, uh, I jump on meetup. I do software a little bit as well. I'm kind of a newbie at it. Uh, so uh, not at your level, but I'm getting there. Um, but I'll, I'll jump on meetups and, uh, you know, I'm learning, learning Python this week. So I'm going to go and jump on a Python meetup and try and just network in the industry. And, and uh, there's one in particular that I do. I, I jump on every month and they become really good friends and they're, they're all really successful in the industry and it's nice to just get that connection and, and have those conversations even if we're not necessarily talking about python or javascript or whatever um it, it's just nice to have them in your back pocket so if you do get stuck you can kind of like hey uh steven can you help me out here <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's real handy but yeah. well and mike i think to your point there you need to be able to ha not have people in the pocket and be able to speak the language to be, have a conversation there are there are always jobs there's always going to be jobs if we think about like knowledge-based work where like somebody has you need certain jobs where there has to be a master as a musician mm -hmm. are you the saxophone player that should be all you really do the pianist same thing for accountants and a lot of you know legal work like Cowbell. that's probably all that they do <laughs> <laughs> nice. But but I think for most people as we're growing and increasingly today because of technology, the it's the it is the generalist that ends up being able to truly succeed. And so you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be as toxic and hear some of the things that like Elon Musk, but there's a book called Range. And it basically walks through all this research from people like usually from athletics all the way up until people that are growing into skills and says, like, who's the best Olympic athlete? It's, you know, the best soccer player at the Olympics. It's not the person who's only done soccer. That's actually very, it's rare to have the Tiger Woods story where the dad gives you clubs when you're really little. The best golfer is typically somebody who has been a great athlete in many things. Well, the same thing applies in business today to be successful. Like too many businesses fail because look, you have a good idea. You need to go get a technical founder to start building something, or you need to hire an outside development shop, but you have no concept of Python or being able to have discussions about Ruby on Rails. And so you get fleeced at the end of the day. You don't know how to make good decisions. If you have a range of talent to be able to at least have those conversations, one, you have people to go talk to, but, but you also, you're teaching yourself, Mike, how to have conversations with people so that you are capable of having them long before you need them. Too many people wait to say, what, what do I need now? No, if you're, if you're a learner, you sh you're always looking to learn more things. And if you care about relationships, then that's naturally going to happen. Yeah, no, yeah I, I like think that's that. really 
Yeah, really an interesting topic. And it had me thinking about, you know, for job seekers, right? It's kind of an interesting world we're living in right now. There's a lot of people looking for work and pe- who can't, uh, you know, find work or whatever. And they're having a really hard time finding their, you know, their niche or the job that fits them just right. And if you look at a lot of these application, you know, uh, or job listings, everybody's looking for, you know, somebody who does this very tight specialty, right? And I think it makes it really hard for like your average job seeker. Well, you know, I have this, this and this skill, right. but I don't have that one. And so, but it's interesting in your experience, you know, because basically, even though you weren't maybe a perfect fit on paper for the position you were pulled into, somebody was smart enough to take a chance on you because you had a set of skills or this range of skills that we're talking about that, um, you know, made you a good fit for that position. Maybe it was personality or whatever it was, but there's something about you that drew, the, drew that person to say, hey, man, we're going to take a chance on you. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just sort of marketing your range of experience, because I do think that at least in your sort of average job circles, and I I don't roll in a lot of them, but, you know, we hire a lot of creative talent and I see these guys on Twitter and stuff complaining about how they can never find a job in an agency. Mm -hmm. They can never, you know, find the work they're looking for and they, you know, nobody's qualified enough for the positions and all these kinds of things. And so, but I think for a lot of these people, I mean, if they have a background kind of like mine, which was an all purpose designer that could do this and that and everything. Uh, how do you market a range of expertise, you know, either for a job seeker or if you're going to do something entrepreneurial? It depends on where they're at in looking for their next role. And so if they're actively looking, I, I think you do need to put a label on yourself. Like if I'm actively looking for, if I was actively looking for my next role, I'm going to bill myself as, I mean, it will depend on the, you know, the role I'm, I'm, I might be applying for, but I'm going to come in as a chief marketing officer, a chief operating officer, a chief strategy officer. I'm not, I can do all of those roles. I'm not going to come in as just the full range person if I was actively looking. Same thing, I think, kind of on the designer level. It's like you, people are, especially recruiters, recruiters, whether they're in-house or especially if they're an outside agency, they're looking to sell a particular type of person. I have a great friend uh, in uh, Atlanta. He really only helps place product marketers. And so he would look at my background and go, Kurt, like you have not been a CMO for the last 20 years. I couldn't take you into a private equity backed company. But yet I get reached out to by private equity backed companies all the time because of the outcomes I'm able to deliver. But in his mind, He's look, he places product marketers. He doesn't help email automation. He doesn't help brand people. He helps product marketers. And so they're looking for that label. And so I think, especially for, for people that, that aren't at the higher levels, you do need to have that label. Here's who you are. If you're not actively looking yet, um, the range is actually a lot more helpful. And so I think that's where the individual should be taking a, a networking approach or a net weaving approach have a reason to reach out with people. And the range is actually very helpful then. Like what I'd love to hear from you, Ryan, I see from you, Ryan, is here's a list of company, like you reach out, hey, Mike introduces us. Here's a list of companies I'm trying to get to know people at. Are you looking for a job? No, they're really interesting. I see this or this agency and you know them intimately and you're looking for connections there. And so like Mike introduces us and you're networking for some of those things and you're then the only thing is like you take the first 15, 20 minutes and you ask me, what am I looking for? And then follow up afterwards to make introductions. Well, that that's the way that people should be looking from a range perspective. Because then when I introduce you to somebody on that, on that uh, list, or I say, I don't know anybody on that list, but if this is why you're interested, maybe you should talk to this company or somebody that might know somebody on that list. The ideal thing for the people with ranges is, is hey, I introduce you to somebody before they have the role before they, they've actually started hiring for it. I mean, what job seekers don't realize is by the time a job goes public, even for like, you know, a general designer, like that job, they've known they need that job for three to six months. They've had the problem for six months before then. So if you could catch them before it goes public, well, that might've been a year before it actually goes public. And so you start talking to the person and then you rely, they express their problems. And you're like, you have a superhero story. Here's how I've solved that before. Now you have a range, you're in a range discussion. And when they decide to go ask for the approval to hire somebody, they're now shaping the role around you, Ryan. And so that's a very different place than how most people look for jobs today. And, um, but also it's a lot better way, I think, just for, for those of us that like talking to people, because when you net weave and network out, well, you're going to, every introduction on average should, should meet you two introductions. And you just have to follow back up with people and you go, oh, Kurt, you're having this problem. Let me help you out. And 
that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Yeah, no, I think that is a, I mean, a super interesting approach. I, and I think you're right that it's completely counter to the way people traditionally look for jobs and, you know, and it's funny cause well, it's not funny actually, but I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, interesting that, you know, I see these kids on Twitter, especially, you know, people who've been laid off a lot of tech people yeah. getting laid off these days. You know, I see these guys and they're like, man, I've applied for 300 jobs. I'm not getting anything. You know, I'm just doing this thing. But I think what you described is this version where instead of just hitting every available position that happens to have the keyword UI or something, you know, instead you're making this focused, concerted effort to actually go out and find work doing what it is you want to do for who it is you want to do it and doing the things that it requires to to do that. Right. So you're you're technically or I guess ostensibly niche, niching down for the position that you want where a lot of these sort of generalist designer types are just like they get into the scarcity mode and they just, you know, scratch for everything. But then they end up spending hours and hours and hours filling out resumes and all this stuff right. times 300 and they never and actually unless get they, success. And unless they actually end up finding stalking on LinkedIn to find the hiring manager, they're still having to go through the HR or the external recruiter filter and, and nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I've been blessed to have incredible uh, sourcing talent uh, before for me, but but not always. And so it's like I got to a point at Navtech, we were a public company. I had finally, my, no, almost any role that I was hiring for, I just said, look, I am only hiring applied mathematicians unless it's somebody that comes from a recommendation because I knew they could never find anything. But I also knew like an applied mathematician, like with a degree in applied mathematics, not, not from a designer perspective. I'm like, I can teach somebody who has a degree in applied mathematics how to do anything. It's a level of systems thinking and it's difficult. You can teach that person to do almost anything. And um, HR hated it. But and <laughs> it kind of gave me free reign then to go source who I wanted to from kind of my network. But I was looking for people that HR at that time, I did not have good uh, internal alt recruiters. They knew they were looking for certain keywords. They were looking for certain schools. We hired a lot of people from Motorola or University of Chicago, which nothing wrong with that, but I, you got group think then. And I wanted diversity of think. I didn't want 17 people in a room that all came from Motorola. I wanted one person or two people from Motorola and then from other companies. And so I, too many people just, you're right. They just go hit apply. They don't personalize anything. And that's not also how things get hired today. Yeah. Well, and I would just add too, I mean, the process for getting into a lot of these companies has become really, I don't know, especially during COVID, I noticed it, that it became really jokey. Like everybody <laughs> wanted you to write an essay on what you would do if you were a pirate captain and you had to, you know, save the seas or something. I mean, like I was seeing the most insane things. And so people are having to spend hours putting together an application, right? right? And so, and I mean, it becomes just not practical to fill out hundreds of those things, right? right. So, I mean, those guys, those companies that are making these kind of resumes, you know, are, or these kind of application processes are probably trying to, you know, get rid of the people who don't really want to work for them, <laughs> you know, that are just shotgun filing uh, application. And then, you know, conversely, the, the people who are applying at these companies, you know, like they're willing to go through the effort because they actually care to work for this company. So I think, I, like, I understand the, the logic, but they did make it pretty tough for a little while for people to apply. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody... Everybody is looking to make the best hiring decisions they can. And I mean, most people make really poor hiring decisions. And so I think a lot of times that's the, the, they don't know exactly what problems they're trying to solve internal. And so that makes it almost impossible for their for the recruiting team to go hire for something if you can't define uh, the, the role. And so I much more like kind of approve with the concept of let's come up with the outcomes and the key results we're trying to reach. I'll loosely define what the role is. I mean, and, and I mean, sometimes it's very, it is very narrow. I'm hiring a product manager in real estate technology like that, that may be there, but I want to talk about, here's the outcomes I want accomplished in the next six months and 12 months when you come on board and I'm going to write, here's the type of person I'm hiring. I want somebody who believes in healthy conflict. They have a bias towards action. They have strong opinions held loosely. Never come to me with a problem unless you can. You actually have a strong opinion about what we should do or options we should be looking at. And then be open to me having a different opinion. Well, that changes how you're hiring. Like I'm still getting, I'm actually getting better product managers in that example than almost anybody else will. But the skills come along with, they're going to tell me stories that they've, done this before. We have a product manager right now from Verizon Innovation. He's incredible. 
But you know, if, if you just look from a resume perspective, he might not look that much different than anybody else. You listen to his superhero stories from the past, you go, oh, now I know why you're here. There, um, I'm listening to Steve Jobs' autobiography right now, and uh, there's a guy that he hired that interviewed horribly. He he <laughs> went through the interview process. Steve was like, "Nah, ain't gonna ain't gonna happen." And the guy went out in the lobby, and he was kind of waiting for his ride, acting a little dejected. And Steve came over and was like, "Hey, it's all right, man, no big deal." And the guy was like, "Can I just show you this one product that I was working on? I didn't get to show it the interview." And it was the toolbar at the bottom that pops up and does the mirror kind of effect. And Steve saw that and instantly hired him on the spot. And even though that the interview didn't necessarily go well, he he saw that and knew he wanted that in his operating system and hired the guy from just based off of that. He's also the guy that developed the infinite scroll on the uh, on the iPhone. And and so it was kind of like it was a, a really a cool you know, story of like, yeah, you might not interview well, you might not be the person that he thought he wanted, but he ended up being the person he needed because of the the product that he was able to implement. And well, he knew the um, experience he was trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, and yeah, to your point, so many people don't know that. So. Right. <laughs> well, and, and, and if you don't know where that's at, one, it's hard for you to hire the best people that are going to help with things. But when you don't, when you cannot define ahead of time or early on what outcomes and results your, your company is trying to reach or what your team is trying to do, you know, from a design perspective, this is the outcomes and results we're trying to drive as part of the company's overall outcomes and results. What happens is you get really poor leaders and managers internal. And so, and, and everybody's going to fail at their job. My, my job as a team leader, yes, I do a ton of work and I believe most leaders should be picking up the shovel and doing work with their teams, so to speak. But, but my job is to make sure that I fully understand what Glenn, our, our big CEO, what he's trying to reach from an outcome perspective, and then make sure everybody in our team understands not just what our team's outcome and results are to accomplish what he's trying to do, but how your individual contribution, Ryan, from an you know, a UI perspective helps to drive that as well. My job as a leader is to make sure that you fully understand that because but if, if you do, well, then you're going to make wise decisions. And what most people, without having that, they don't realize no matter how much you try to micromanage, you cannot possibly be involved in all of the micro decisions that are made. And so from a, if we stay with the UI example, like there's so many p decisions that you have to make when you're coming up with that UI that, I, unless I literally just do the work for you or sit over your shoulder the whole time, I, if I'm trying to re reach something, I need you to know what all we're trying to accomplish so that you can bring me solutions, bring me options to get there because I couldn't even micromanage that. I need to, I need you to m know the the outcomes and help us get there and then push back when you go, well, Kurt, here's the conflicting things. You want this, but then you're going to lose this over there. I By in making sure everybody is, 100% on board with the outcomes, it forces healthy conflict that should happen in innovative companies. And that's the same thing, whether or not it's at a big technology company, and that's what I'm doing right now is technology, or if you're in an electrical company and you're 15, you have a 15 van, you know, uh, electrical company, well, you're trying to grow, you're trying to solve things. You need people to understand why it matters that they let you know when they're about done with the job. So you can, it, it's, it, it, otherwise people are like, ah, Man, I mean, Mike's just trying to get, he's on my case again. He's making sure that I'm not going over to the donut shop or something. No, I'm wanting to know when you're going to be done so that Ryan can call the next client and let them know that, that you're on the way. And so they can finish up whatever Zoom call that they're doing. If you know that, you don't feel like I'm micromanaging you. I'm, you know, but if I don't explain that to you, if I don't explain the outcomes, the whole world shifts and it's the businesses fail. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So one of the things that I learned about you, and you've uh, talked a little bit about it in this story, but also just in doing research for you, is that you're a big advocate for servant leadership and this idea of servant leadership. I suspect that a big part of your formation like that came from strong mentorship early on, which is what you were sort of mentioning earlier with working at, you know, former Disney execs and these kind of people. So as you start to, you know, become more of a leader yourself, you know, and you start to mature into that role, how important, or I guess, what part of your job do you still do today 
that is sort of in a mentorship capacity and like what kind of value do you place on mentorship versus let's say traditional education? Very, I am not a proponent of most traditional education. I mean, there are things that, you know, where there are fields where you have to do that, but you know, there's even places where it's like, I, you know, Hey, a software or, you know, a computer science degree from Georgia tech, that's going to help you if you're looking at for a CTO role at certain levels. But I would almost always rather hire a Ruby engineer who's been a hacker for the last five years. I have a friend right now. He's uh, dating a woman who's got a 14 year old brilliant son who is literally trying to figure out like, like, I mean, he's an incredible coder. What does he do to kind of set him up for success? I'm like, I'm like, Charles, you, you make sure that that kid is programming somewhere right now. So that when, whether he goes to college or not, he can say, Hey, when he's 18, here's my portfolio in the background. I, I don't care from what I've heard. I wouldn't care if that kid ever went to school or not. Like there's no formal education that's going to make, I mean, that's going to get him past where he's already at. Experience will do that. Same thing with UI, same thing with sign. It's so easy to be self-taught or do courses right now. I mean, I took an entire customer success team through uh, two levels of a customer success manager training. I mean, the team leader doesn't doesn't have a college degree. I don't care if she has a college degree. She was great at her job before. She had, you know, eight months of kind of part-time training in the background. And now she's gone from being good to being exceptional. That's not really formal education. Formal education is college degrees. And most of the time, it's wasted time for me. So much is self-taught. You asked about my leadership style. I mean, I kind of divide my, my real work. There is work that only Kurt can do, like where we're at. Where we're at. I do a bunch of strategy work. I do a lot. I mean, I do a ton of, of normal work. But I also spend a huge bit of my time doing work with other people on my team because that's the best way to coach them is to say, let's just pull up together and do this right now. Um, because how do I get you to be better at design if I don't think you're where I would like? Well, I can explain the outcomes more when we're doing that work together and we're pairing on it for the next four hours. Um, I can also just say, hey, let me just take control and talk through why I'm making changes as well. That's actually that's much more of what I do, I think, from a leader perspective. And I think everybody should do, whether you look at a Chick-fil-A or you look at other servant leadership organizations, like that's what, that's what software companies do. It's like you teach people by doing it with them and coaching the product. I, um, I applied for a software job a few months ago and I was, um, they wanted me to show them how to do some CI CD work, uh, for the pipeline for, auto deployment for GitHub. And, um, I had never done that. And so I spent the whole week studying up on it, trying to learn about CI CD pipelines, trying to learn about all that fun stuff. And then we sat down and we did a code review in a peer session. And some of the stuff that I had taught myself, I actually was teaching them in the code pairing because it was newer technology that I had found in the learning process that they didn't, hadn't implemented. So it was actually kind of cool because they had some things that they knew. And even me as a new person that didn't really know much about pipelines or any of that stuff, I was able to kind of teach them, Hey, this is something cool that I found. And then they asked me to go in deep about it. And I'm like, I can't, I learned about it yesterday. <laughs> but it, uh, so, but it, it's, that it's, does sound though, like uh, the, the range of expertise that we were just talking about. Right. And I think that this is also probably just education. Right. Because, I mean, even if you are college educated, right, not every kid comes out the same. They don't all learn the exact right. same bits of information or retain the same bits or apply the same bits in the same way. So I think your point, Mike, I mean, you know, I, I have come from a, a similar background to you in that I'm largely self-taught, you know, like we were talking about earlier, kind of growing up through technology developing. And uh, and so, yeah, no. So I have really deep experience in a lot of different ways. But the way that I approach a problem might not be the same that somebody that was just trained or took a course or something, for example. Right. Well, the the, the and, code and, and technology is the, so much. Yeah. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. I, I, say, I was just going to say that. that... <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm done. <laughs> things, things are moving so fast with technology, and technology impacts almost everything. And so, like, takes take four years and go to school and put that up against somebody who's been playing with chat GPT, um, or there's so many AI design technologies now, and it's like, look. I, I don't need I don't need a junior programmer to do a lot of Python stuff. I know people that are leading enterprise SEO 
for Fortune 500 companies that before they would have been going to the engineering team for things, and now they're feeding they're feeding their requests um, into uh, Chat GPT basically, and they're getting back Python scripts that they're then handing back over to an engineering team to do things. And it's like, well, I can do the same thing with design. I would take anybody who's been experimenting with AI. I mean. I'm showing real estate agents right now. I've got, I'm running a mastermind with like 500 real estate agents. I walk there and I show them, look, here's how, and I gave them the prompts because you can share so many of the prompts as well. Hey, you don't need to go hire a junior marketer anymore. Here's the prompts to go out and create a year of social media content in the next two hours. And then here's how to batch schedule that and or plan it and then schedule it out. And I'm like, by the way, you shouldn't be scheduling. You could. But you could hire somebody for five dollars an hour to do that, you know, from from a VA perspective. But you can use Chat GPT, use your own knowledge, and like that person is so much more valuable than somebody who comes out of college with a four year marketing degree or has been doing market marketing for four years but hasn't been playing with any of the new AI tools. Like AI from a writing perspective, it's it, it, like if you know how to use it, it's incredible. If you don't know how to use it, you're going to have a really poor result, and you're going to think you're on the the newest trend. Same thing for design or anything. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So one of the things I want to decide to sort of dovetail off of on the mentorship thing is because I know that you've spent a lot of time investing in companies and being surrounded by startups and young entrepreneurs that are trying to develop ideas. I wonder, I mean, one of the biggest struggles that I think a lot of them have is they have this great idea. Maybe they start getting their business. But I want to ask you, this is a broad question, but as it pertains to membership, can anybody scale? Meaning is this kind of ability to grow a company in the way that you've described or the way that you've you know shown in your experience like is that available to everybody can they learn those skills can they become that because i think that there's this thing where a lot of young entrepreneurs get trapped in this cycle of you know reading every book and watching every youtube video and trying to learn all the tricks and and all these things and then when it comes time to application they never actually cross the precipice and i think some of that is just confidence and you don't know where to step if you don't have maybe a good mentor but I wonder, like, is it actually open to anybody? Could any, you know, can, can people do this or does it require exceptional people to be able to grow a company? Anybody can do it, especially on the scaling perspective. Anybody can set up for scaling, whatever, whatever industry they're in even. But it often does take a mentor for a lot of people because we're not trained in it. It's a really simple process. Like you need to plan what you're going to do. You need to document the things that are repeatable into systems. And you need to have a regular plan of review that says back, did I actually do what I said I was going to do? Too many entrepreneurs, heck, too many people that are product managers just at really big companies or software engineers. They just, they're doing, they feel the weight of all the things they they feel like they need to do. And so they, they don't document anything. And the problem is you're never going to scale that way. It is possible that if you're just always doing that, you might be one, the one in a hundred thousand that lucks out and becomes Zuckerberg and comes up with something. But I mean, the success rates are horrible. I mean, I've written angel investment checks. My wife and I have different risk tolerances. I don't write them anymore. It's like philanthropy, basically. I mean, this, <laughs> the, the failure rates are high, but, but I look at myself and I'm like, on a weekly basis, and I do this more than once a week, but I mean, every Sunday I sit down and go, hey, this is what I said I was going to do last week. Did I actually accomplish the things that I said was most important? Do I, you know, did I do repeated things that I don't have documented anywhere? And then I, I adjust my plan for the next week based on that. That's, I mean, that's hugely important on there because that piece of that is not just, am I doing what I said I'm going to do, but it's the documenting bit of it. Like you scale by being able to hand things to other people whether that's training people how to do something or truly handing it to somebody else in your team or a VA. And so to be able to do that, how do you hand something to somebody that doesn't sit next to you all the time? You need to say, hey, if you're a real estate agent and I walk through the process I just did, you need to have a Google Doc that says, here's the steps I do with links to those tools that do that, kind of an SOP. Well, the same thing if you're an electrician, how do you schedule appointments? If you're, a, if you're a UI person, what steps do you do every time an assignment comes in? Well, you should be going back to the product manager and saying, hey, what are they trying to accomplish? What goals are they trying? What problems are they trying to solve? Because they just say, hey, I need you to come make the, make the design do this. Well, yeah. maybe that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. And I, and that's, you know, one of those things. And I, I think it's a really good point that you mentioned that the just the fact that we're not trained for this, right? Because like, 
So I'm a, you know, sort of self-taught lifelong kind of entrepreneur. I always joke I'm designer first, business guy, second, third, fourth, fifth, something <laughs> like it, it's not my bag, right? I'm a cre creative guy, really good at thinking conceptually and strategically. I'm really good at all this, you know, range of stuff like we were talking about earlier. But when it comes down to grow the business, scale the business, manage the money, like I'm ridiculously bad. And I've done the classes, I take all the things and I try and do it. I just can't wrap my head around it. And so, it, you know, for me, I'm at this pivot point where I'm like, well, God, I've got to figure out how to get out of this thing, right? And mentorship's been what I've been trying to pursue is try and find somebody that knows what they're doing that can help me uh, navigate, how, you know, whatever the next step is. Because, you know, yeah. I'm getting older and I could use a little help before I'm ancient. But, and, and that's um, the reason that that groups like EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, Vistage, Convene is kind of the Christian version of both of those. The reason those exist is because there is value. I mean, there's value enough for people to pay thousands of dollars on a monthly basis to be with, you know, eight to 10 other people in the same kind of size of growth to be coached through the accountability. But but you can do it yourself. I, I do prefer the kind of mentoring abilities that you're talking about and having it done that way. But people can do that themselves. It's just... It's hard. I mean, you have to kick your own ass. I mean, and if you're if you have a team, part of teaching your team how to do this is exposing how difficult it is for you. I mean, I expose to my team all the time. Look, I'm telling you all to try to do this, and I'm failing at this one piece myself right now. Like, did I actually do this Sunday review? Looking back at my, I mean, I do that on the personal side as well as I do on work. And it's like I I tell some people on my team. Did I do that or not? But I also have a mastermind group of people um, that are very similar to me where I'm not paying like an EO perspective, but I'm being very transparent and I've given permission to those people to say, hey, look, your your job is to kick my is to kick my ass. Like if I say this is important um, and I'm trying to do this, then you need to ask me, well, why the hell didn't you do it? And 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 like that's that's how you love on people. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. Well, and it, it seems so counterintuitive, right? I mean, I've, I've only had a couple coaches over the years, um, you know, that maybe weren't the perfect coaches, but I picked up little things from each of them. Right. And, uh, you know, and it is expensive and it is time consuming. And I will say the one thing that I look back on those situations and regret is that maybe there wasn't, you know, maybe not enough follow through on their end, but I also didn't maybe take enough personal responsibility to make sure I was doing the things they were telling me. So right. they're giving me their theories and their ideas and all these things and saying, go try this. And then every week I'm coming back and going, well, I didn't get to it this week, right. you know? And, uh, and so I'm willing to accept that that's my fault, but at the same time, it's like, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, find mentorship, but not just find somebody and waste their time, but actually, you know, benefit from the mentorship, I think has been a real struggle for me. And I don't know if that's, choosing mentors that maybe aren't totally ready to mentor me or maybe the wrong mentor for, for me in that given situation. But I think that, uh, you know, I agree with you that having a mentor is probably the way to do it versus trying to just, you know, do it yourself. But I yeah. think for a lot of us, especially people like in, in my industry or other people who are, are sort of solopreneurs or more like, um, uh, you know, tacticians in the business than more than they are, you know, actual business leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you, it's easy to get caught up just doing the work every, every week. And then there's no time to actually work on the business. Right. I mean, there's plenty of these cliches, you know, the work on the business, not in the business or whatever, yeah. but it, you know, but it, you know, for the people who are doing the work and trying to run the business, it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah. I think, I mean, a lot of it, when you're looking for somebody that's going to help guide, guide you through that, you, you look at, look at the, either who the person is or the structure that's set up about how you engage with them who the person is. Well, if it's an individual and, and a, like mentoring to me usually is an unpaid thing. And so, which is okay. But like for me, mentoring, why is that person mentoring? And so that could be a faith perspective, um, whether it's work-wise or not. And, or, or but it's usually going to be somebody that's at least one and probably two seasons ahead of me from a, from a, in the career path. And they're doing it either from a faith perspective or for whatever reason, they feel like somebody did this for me and I want to do this now for you, Ryan. And so that's okay, but but you need to identify that. And I, I like having that discussion up front. If it's on the other side and very similar and it's more of coaching, well, coaching is a paid gig then. Well, I think too many coaches, one, they haven't done it themselves and like, don't go hire somebody to coach you through that if they haven't, they don't have a proven track record. But, but also most of those coaches, like, they're, they're structured to keep you talking to them, kind of like a counselor, not to solve your problems. And so 
like I do very few of those. And now, now I'll only act as an executive coach if I'm also a board member of a company. And so they'll kind of come in, you know, um, together. But in those cases, like we're talking about it upfront. Hey, they're similar, but from the executive coaching perspective, it's a 12 month commitment. You're paying me a check for that. Like we're, there's none of this, like, Hey, if you don't like it after like 60 days, no, you're committing upfront um, to that. And with that, here's what I expect out of you. That gives me permission to be a little bit more firm and hold you accountable, knowing that, well, like after three months, you, you're not just going to say, hey, I quit my gym membership. Like you already paid for the year kind of thing. Right. And so I think how you set it up up front very much, it gives the person permission. Um, and you have to keep doing that. Even if it's on that mentoring perspective, I think you have to repeatedly give that person permission to, to, to do the role that they're, tr they're wanting to do for you. That's, that seems right. Um, one thing that I learned sort of in, you know, watching and, and listening to and reading up on you a little bit was something that I think is really important for young entrepreneurs, but I don't think a lot of people do it, which is sort of iteratively building. So it seemed to me that your style of building companies, and, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that I took it anyway, was that you're not afraid to let sort of good be the enemy of perfect, right? And so, because there's a lot of people that I think get caught up in building their business and then they never launch, right? This maybe goes back to that idea earlier about sort of fear and action, you know, or fear of taking action, I should say. Right. And so, you know, so a lot of people will build and build and build and build and build, but never actually get to launch, right? right. And I think a big part of that is, you know, trying to attain perfection or make a perfect product or whatever. And it sounded to me that in your case, you seem to be a little bit more iterative, which is, you know, yes, we want a good product, but like, let's get to whatever a certain level is. And then, you know, we'll iterate and we'll grow and we'll get better. Like we're not seeking perfection from round one. And so that's given you the ability to be, you know, maybe fit into these hyper growth scenarios, right? Because you're maybe able to be a little more agile than somebody who's spending so much time trying to get perfect. So I wondered if you'd just talk a little bit about sort of your process of sort of growing and scaling companies. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of intricacy there, but I wonder if you'd just talk about it maybe sort of from a philosophical. Yeah, I agile and iterations that that's how you get real growth. That's especially how you get hyper growth, but anything I think that's how real real growth happens. Not that I'm not trying for great. I mean, I I think the best way I can serve people though and get to great is by starting with something. Anybody who's ever built a product, anybody who's ever done a design, like the only thing that you, that I can promise them is when you release it, you're going to realize that you were wrong on a whole bunch of things when people start using it. And so you're going to know that when you give your first version, your seventh version to, to customers and you see how they interact with it. And so, you know, I mean, is good the, is good the enemy of great? Uh, maybe, but you're never going to get great if you, nowadays if you don't just launch that product and get it out there. I think agile is the way... I mean, it's definitely the way of any technology company, but it's the way of most things. I mean, I'm working in a real estate company that didn't even exist like 17 years ago or 15 years ago. And now it's the largest independent company in the US because they iterate and they're agile. That's a big thing. They didn't wait for it to be perfect. You get it out there and you have people start using it and you adjust as you go. And too many people, they're scared. Like they keep, when you, try building for greatness, you're also much more likely to have perfectionism. And is it really better? Or are you just scared that people aren't going to like what you put out there? Like yeah. put it out there and let people know. I think the way that you get growth is momentum. And so how do you build a hundred million dollar company? Well, you don't just, there's no perfection that you could work on a product and then just launch it and be there next year. Like that, that doesn't happen anywhere. You momentum is how you grow and you can't have momentum without having something that's out there. And so iterate and agile and test. And when you get it out there, the data is going to tell you whether you are right or wrong. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I, I, you know, like I say, I think it's something that people do struggle with, but I think you've uncovered what it is and, and it is fear, which, you know, seems to be a recurring theme of the, the topics I keep going back to here is this idea of overcoming fears really. Um, you know, so I wonder if you'd talk about it a little bit from your perspective, obviously you came from a high achieving family. You came from people who sort of encouraged your entrepreneurship early on. You have been mentored by, you know, top level entrepreneur, you know, I guess, you know, the upper pinnacle of, of these top people who are entrepreneurial. So it seems to me, you know, and you mentioned it earlier between you and your wife, your, your, uh, risk tolerances. And so, um, you know, I wonder if you talk just about 
sort of, you know, overcoming fear as you've maybe seen it more in the people you've worked with and in yourself? Because it seems like maybe this isn't as big an issue for you as it might be for other young entrepreneurs. Oh, it's a huge issue for me. I'll just, I mean, it's still an issue for me. I mean, but I mean, I do acknowledge, I mean, I've failed so many times. Most people would crawl under the table and die. I mean, <laughs> and, but, but when I'm scared of things, I, I usually, expo- I try to, I don't always get it right. I, one, I do have that, that, that mastermind group, as I talk about, I also have a faith-based group that's that way as well, where those two groups know everything about me in those two, ca- in the categories, and they know what I'm scared about. And so that's important to talk about, but on my team, when I identify that something's held me back because of fear, I, I bring it up because when I bring it up about myself, it's not so confrontational when I bring it up to you, Ryan, and go, hey, why aren't you launching this? Why is it taking you three days to do something that I think should have been three hours or a day? And so I think the best way that you can do that in your team is to tell them where it comes up for you. That does take self-reflection. Uh, as somebody who loves podcasts, who loves audiobooks, I, it's rare for me to listen to anything that's less than 2X and usually I'm on 3X. And it's like, well, it's really easy to always have an audiobook. The only way you get self-reflection and go, why did I not do this? Well, you have to have silence. And, and that doesn't mean you have to be in the woods with nothing around you. It does mean that you have to not have stimuli coming in all the time uh, or, and or sit down and think about it. And then when you do, tell your team about it because they'll also be more likely to bring it up to you then. And they may bring it up to you or they may, may bring it up in front of the team, but you need them talking about it. Yeah, the uh, the point about stimuli is actually very interesting, especially given sort of, I don't know, the makeup of today's society as a father of a couple teenagers who are, you know, consistently uh, embedded in Instagram or, or Twitter or whatever it is they're doing these days. Um, it seems like stimuli has never been at a, you know, higher volume. Uh, you know, it seems like, I mean, yeah. even even for me as an older person, I mean, like I'm consistently on a podcast, on YouTube, reading a book, you know, doing whatever. And, you know, you can make an argument those things are good, you know, as long as they're educational or bringing you joy or whatever it is. But at the same time, yeah, man, it's a lot of noise. <laughs> right. So it seems like maybe there's something, uh, you know, component here that, you know, is this a, I mean, I think in the past we would have sort of called it an anal- analysis by paralysis, but I, I wonder if this isn't really analysis or uh, paralysis by analysis, rather it's a, uh, I don't know, sort of just like this bombardment, like you're uh, incapable of movement because you're being bombarded. It's both that you're incapable of bombardment. And I think a lot of times people, they don't realize that the English language is horrible in a lot of ways in that we have condensed so many different words into a single word. And so like, if you look at say the term meditation, and so meditation, there's really two general schools of meditation. And so how do you take that self-time for reflective thought? Well, there's an Eastern and a Western approach. There's an approach that says, my job, if I'm sitting here to be quiet, is to empty my mind of as much as possible. And there's a place for that. But that's what most people think being quiet is now. Then, then there's a different style that says, well, no, being quiet is, is instead of just emptying your mind, it's trying to focus on only one thing. Like in the faith perspective, well, one is emptying your mind to kind of accept the universe. The other one is saying, hey, I'm trying to just refocus myself on Jesus Christ, if that's, if that's where you're at. That's a different type of refocusing your mind. Focusing your mind, a lot of times executives will talk about, and designers, I, I love hearing this as well from, uh, I need to stare out the window time. And so my, I'm not trying to empty my mind. I'm literally, whether I'm staring out the window or not, I'm trying to say, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. And I'm only thing I'm trying to do is focus on just that. And when my mind wanders, I'm, t- I'm re- t- saying that's okay to wander. And I'm coming back to this one thing that I'm trying to think about. Well, that's it, stimuli doesn't allow you to do either of those two types of meditation. And they both have a place. And usually we're not doing that focusing on one thing that, that really needs to be done today. Mm-hmm. No, it's a great point. I, I mean, I think that we've created this sort of hustle culture. And it's sort of, you know, exacerbated by the just rapid influx of data and how much information you can be taking in at any given time, you know, whether it's videos or podcasts or whatever. And I think that all that, you know, basically occupies the space. And I think part of it too, is it tricks us into thinking we're doing something. 
And so we spend a lot of time, you know, flipping through tweets and, you know, oh, well, I walked away with, you know, okay, I read a couple threads that were interesting and I walked away with some knowledge or something. So it feels like I just spent that hour effectively when in real life, I probably wasted that hour and I didn't really get a lot out of it, you know? Right. And so I think that there's something to be said about that, which is, um, you know, we need to probably figure out how to reduce our, our, you know, stimuli from the outside so that we can maybe figure out how to better make time for those kinds of things, because right. I think it is a, it is critical, you know, somebody, you know, at least more so in the past than today, but you know, who used to bill a lot of time hourly, um, mighty hard to justify to a client while you're sitting there doing nothing for an hour, you know, or multiple hours, even while you're sitting and thinking and concepting and doing whatever. Right. And, you know, for, as a creative person, and I'm sure, you know, you, you can empathize is, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking and it's got to be, I mean, I, I guess accounted for, but it doesn't look like much, you know, when you're trying to explain to your clients why you're hanging so much. It, it, it does. It depends on how you set up those discussions up front. I usually will like, I'll have that conversation with, with clients a lot of times, but, uh, like, Hey, we don't just start doing this. You don't just start building a house. You have a plan. And so who comes up with that plan? If we don't have the plan, like how much time does it take to do that? And so I'll kind of walk through my process sometimes, but, but either way you do need to find time to do that. But that self-reflective time that's how you end up getting to scaling what we talked about before. And how do you get to innovation from an operations perspective or new design? Yeah. And it's so funny that even just now, I feel like we've sort of wrapped this whole thing in a circle, which is start with the end in mind as cliche yep. as that is to say that, you know, that seems to be the answer to scaling. That seems to be the answer to, you know, business development. That seems to be the answer to, you know, mental wellness and making sure that we're taking time to think. You know, like the, the answer is, you know, we need to understand our purpose and not to get too tied up and, you know, your start with whys or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, at the same time, you know, understanding where you're going sure makes it a lot easier to get there. So yeah. as we're, uh, you know, coming to the end of this, uh, Kurt, I wonder if you just take a quick minute, let people know how they can get in touch with you. Uh, if you've got websites you'd like people to visit, if there's some way to reach out or get in uh, contact with you. Yeah, the best way to find me is my own personal website, Kurt Euler, U H L I R dot com. You can also just Google Kurt Servant Leadership. And uh, I mean, if you Google Servant Leadership, I'll come usually come up top, number one, anyways. But um, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I have a lot of kind of free materials on there. I've turned down a couple of book deals because I'd rather give stuff away for free. So you find things on there about how to lead companies and how to do that net weaving discussion that we talked about earlier. Excellent. Well, Kurt, I could go on another hour, but uh, I think we'll call it a day. So thanks so much for uh, taking the time to do this, man. I really appreciate this. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And see you guys next time.